Prime Blog or Prime Media audiences, uh, welcome. Uh, thank you for joining us. Today, um, I have a special guest again, um, Mr. Lawrence Freeman. Um, Mr. Lawrence Freeman is joining us uh, from the Washington DC area. Um, without further ado, I would like uh, for Mr. Freeman to introduce himself, what he does, um, how he relates to Ethiopia, and uh, we shall con continue the discussion. Mr. Freeman, thank you for joining me and joining the audience in Ethiopia. Welcome, and uh, please introduce yourself. Good evening, everyone. It's about a little after six o'clock here on the United States East Coast. Yes, I have been involved in Africa for a long time. It was, it's gone through various phases. I'm uh, getting up there as a senior citizen, but when I was actually a young guy in high school, I was thinking about Africa and why there were so many difficulties in, in feeding and providing for the population. And uh, over many years, I was intensely political in US politics. And I started to uh, gravitate back to Africa about 30 years ago and started writing about Africa and putting forth my policies for the continent in terms of economic development. And uh, people began to follow me. And uh, eventually uh, some people wanted to see me uh, in Nigeria in 1994. I landed in Lagos in June of 1994. And now I've been to Africa maybe about 25 times. Half of those visits have been to Nigeria, uh, many to Sudan several to Ethiopia, uh, also to Mali, a visit to Chad. And uh, I guess I'll keep uh, probably keep expanding as I go along. And my ideas in Africa are very clear for me. And my mission is very clear, which is to eliminate hunger and poverty in Africa. That's what I want to do in my lifetime. And I know how to do it, which is that Africa right now suffers the greatest deficits in infrastructure of any continent in the world. If we measure electrical power, it's a disaster for Africa. The lack of electricity is literally killing the African people. In some cases worse than others, but for Sub-Saharan Africa it is very bad. And the lack of rail transportation is very critical for development. And uh, we don't see that level of rail transportation and road development and the number of hot, hot, uh, hospitals per thousand members of the population, the number of hospital beds per thousand members, the number of doctors per thousand citizens. All these figures for Sub-Saharan Africa are very, very poor. And there are many people who wanna promote various policies and I don't uh, object to that. But as a physical economist, that is, I, I look at the physical inputs into an economy and the physical outputs. How many uh, production of tons of rice per acre do we produce? How much consumption per acre of electricity? How much consumption per capita of electricity? How much product per capita production? I look at these figures because these are the criteria for increasing the standard of living. And all economies in the history of modern history depend on an integrated infrastructure platform. And on that platform, the economy grows. And that platform itself is constantly changing and advancing due to new technologies. And this is how economies continue to develop. And we will not, there's no objective problems in Africa. I've been in many countries, the fertility of the soil is excellent, there's water, we just can move it from one place to another if we like, which is what human beings do. If we invest in electricity, in rail transportation, roads, hospitals, water, sanitation, et cetera. There is no objective reason that Africa cannot eliminate hunger, it cannot eliminate poverty and become a modern, uh, a, a continent of modern nations. And I will say since we're on an Ethiopian media outlet, there's a wonderful expression that came from the grouping uh, around Melis anyway early on in, I guess, around 2000. Uh, and it became a, a one of my uh, slogans, which is the Ethiopian leadership said, we don't want to manage poverty, 
we want to eliminate it. And that is my, that's my goal. And I run, a, I have a website, which I started three and a half years ago, called Lawrence Freeman, Africa in the I have a Twitter, LK Freeman's Africa, and I have my Facebook. And I've been able to circulate hundreds and hundreds of articles on my website, which many of my viewers, my readership has increased massively over the last year. And uh, I'm hoping that, well, we continue to have uh, influence in determining the future of uh, the African continent. Thank you, Mr. Freeman. Uh, really uh, appreciate the work that, that you do. Um, some of the highlights that I've seen from your work is, um, um, you know, policy changes, uh, advocacy, and one of the highlighted things that came to my mind was how um, um, you worked on um, Sudan when uh, Sudan was accused of uh, uh, slavery. Yes. Um, can you tell us a little bit about that? Well, you, uh, we have in the world a certain political faction. I would call them the political economic elite or political economic oligarchy. And they want to maintain their influence. They're actually not in any one country, although they're financially based in, in the city of London. And they don't want strong countries and they don't want strong national governments in Africa because if, if they're weak, then these economic political forces can manipulate them. And if you take the case of Bashir in Sudan, who I was able to meet on occasion, uh, there were all kinds of problems with Sudan. I mean, I spent a lot of time trying to convince them to go with my policy. But the reason that Bashir was attacked and the reason the ruling government was attacked was because they were actually represented a nationalist outlook for the country. It was limited. In particular, they did not understand the importance of developing South Sudan. But it was a government that represented uh, their view of how to hold the country together. And, and this, this, of course, in each country, and we can discuss Ethiopia in a little bit, but I look for in each country a major event that helps determine the psychology of the country. And in Ethiopia, it was obvious to me that once the the forces of the Mahdi uh, defeated uh, Chinese Gordon to remove them of his head in 1885, January. They actually ran an independent Islamic state from 1885 to 1898. How they were not controlled by the British and they were not controlled by Egypt. And that battle, uh, that those 13 years instilled in them a certain understanding of a nation and then, of course, they were they suffered a massive defeat in Amadan under Kitchener, where they lost 20, 30,000 followers of the Mahdi. But that event also became a source of strength. So they were defeated in 1898 and brought back under the control of the British through Egypt with the Anglo-Egyptian uh, condominium. But they had experienced something like nationhood, and that helped them. The problem was that uh, certain elements of the leading groups in Sudan did not properly understand the importance of economic development and especially of uh, integrating and developing the infrastructure throughout the country and in South Sudan. I was opposed to the separation of South Sudan. That was done by various political forces of the British and Americans because they wanted to use South Sudan as a vehicle to bring down Khartoum, and I opposed it. And I said things would not go well. Now, there'd been a disaster for South Sudan. It was the wrong decision. And it was supported by some very influential people in the United States who didn't like the fact that I opposed them. But uh, now Sudan is separated and they're suffering uh, very, very difficult economic conditions. And I don't see any policies coming from the West or inside Sudan that uh, is going to lead to any uh, significant change in the near future. I'm going to try to see if I can have some input, but I don't know if, if my ideas will succeed or not. Great. Thank you for that brief description. So um, let's, let's get to our main topic about Ethiopia. I read the last two articles that you wrote um, 
on Ethiopia. Uh, one was Horn of Africa endangered by untrue media attacks um, on Ethiopia. Uh, and then the other one was um, about Adwa and Adwa's fighting and uh, Ethiopia is fighting another battle today uh, to protect its sovereignty and uh, to protect its sovereignty. Um, I read both of the articles and um, uh, unfortunately, yes, Ethiopia is going through a lot right now. Uh, as we speak, um, uh, there was uh, the UNS, uh, the UN meeting yesterday, Security Council meeting yesterday. Um, Ethiopia is under a lot of pressure. Um, we um, uh, we are in need of uh, support uh, for our victims uh, through due to the law enforcement uh, operation. Um, at the same time, uh, the Ethiopian government has been um, committed um, to um, to really uh, to really support victims. At the same time, to work with the international partners. Um, you know, considering that you wrote these two articles, uh, what do you think, and uh, what do you think is going on in Ethiopia uh, right now? Yeah, it's a very interesting case. There's a lot of factors into Ethiopia. Ethiopia became to my attention many years ago because I was looking for countries that had a policy for economic development in terms of physical economic growth. And Ethiopia stood out to me. And I analyzed the, the two Ethiopian transformation plans that they had produced from uh, 2009 to 2014 and 2014 to 2019. And I began to look at the writings of Mela Zenawe, which very few are in English, most are in Aramic, Amaric. So uh, they have a conception from Melis uh, down through other aspects of today's leadership of actually building infrastructure to uplift uh, the economy and improve the conditions of life. Uh, the uh, Ethiopian uh, Addis Ababa Djibouti Railroad was an excellent example of this which I was at the inauguration of and went on the inaugural train ride for a couple of kilometers. Um, they have the same approach in the light manufacturing industries that they're uh, carrying out in southern parts of the country, Hawassa and elsewhere. They're sort of leading in some of these uh, uh, economic centers. And I was impressed by this direction that they were taking for physical economic growth. I did not see that in many of the other African countries I study. So that caught my attention and I began to look at the, these policies and then of course got more into the history of Ethiopia and traveled there three times. And I would say look the, the current problem, you have a legitimate problem, historical problem, and then you have what's being done to Ethiopia by the West. Uh, first of all, you look at, uh, let's start with the Battle of Adwa, which we just celebrated a couple of days ago, the 125th anniversary. This was a stunning achievement for Africa. And this again was one of those moments where this shaped the psychology of the future of Ethiopia because a, what was considered by the West and to be a savage, heathen, uneducated group of Africans beat and defeated a European military on the field of battle. And this shook the foundations of the colonial powers. You, you, you go back and you read the headlines that came out that week, not just in, in the Italian prime minister resigned, but the British were shaken up and everybody was shaken up. And of course, this became something that was uh, aspired to by the rest of the African nations who were all colonialized. Ethiopia is the only country that not, was not colonialized. Therefore, they don't have an independence day. We have July 4th, Nigeria has October 1st, uh, Ghana has a, uh, March 6th. Ethiopia has Adwa Day because they were actually never colonized. And this is part of what I believe is an important part of the Ethiopian psychology or mindset. The problem is when you form, when the government was formed, in 1991, when the uh, ERDPF overthrew the fascist Marxist third regime, various compromises were made due to historical reasons. 
The Constitution, which I studied and I wrote about in an article called The Prosperity Party, A Revolutionary Necessity, the Constitution was a compromise. And it, was, it allowed and it recognized ethnic differences throughout the country and established a federalism that was based on ethnic, what I would call, what is called today ethno-nationalism. So one region of the country had majority of people in it were of one ethnicity and another and another. And the constitution itself was weak on the point of identifying a single unitary Ethiopian identity, which the best starting point was Adwa. Even, and Adwa, of course, was in Tigray, it was, uh, not far from Aksum. Mm -hmm. so the fact of the matter is, that is the starting point. There is one Ethiopian nation which rallied together to defeat a colonial imperialist power. And now we have various ethno-nationalism, uh, ethnic groups fighting each other. And this unfortunately was been allowed to fester over many years, especially since the modern constitution of 1995. So that is a complicated problem. Now, when you have one of these groups, which is part of the state of the nation state, I would say the sovereign nation state of Ethiopia, attacked a military outpost in Mekele, uh, this is a cause for war. And if the government did not respond with uh, attacking the TPLF leadership and securing that region, then I believe Ethiopia could have fell apart. That's where there was a distinct possibility, very much like the Balfa War almost destroyed Nigeria. So there was no, in my mind, there was no question. I mean, the United States, had fought a very difficult civil war when Fort Sumter was attacked in uh, April of uh, 1861. The Ethiopian response was correct. There was no other response they could have taken. Otherwise, Abiy would have, the prime minister, Abiy Ahmed, would have been presiding over a country that would have split apart, much like the South was intending to split apart from the North. Since that time, what you've seen is a faction in the West is political, financial, oligarchical faction that does not want to see strong central leadership, does not want to see nationalist figures in African countries, not other countries as well, but especially in Africa. And therefore, the prime minister has now come under very vicious attack, including a statement by the U.S. Secretary of State, Blinken, intervening and telling the Ethiopians who or who could or could not be and deployed militarily in defeating the TPLF leadership in Tigray. That's an infringement on the sovereignty. And then you have all kinds of groups, Amnesty International, uh, Human Rights Coalition, and then including a, a media outfit, CNN, which does not do a good job reporting in the United States. And all of a sudden CNN produces a report with no source backup of a massacre in uh, Axum, and that becomes legitimate consideration as a, a fact of life when it hasn't been proven. So the problem is you have an attempt by outside forces, financial political forces to weaken Ethiopia. And I believe that there is an effort underway inside and outside Ethiopia presently to regime, uh, re remove President, uh, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed, a regime change policy. That's what I think is on, the go, is on the way right now, could be on the way. And if it's not stopped, it could lead to an overthrow of the government. That's entirely feasible given what I view as looking at what's going on. On the other hand, you do have a problem of ethno-nationalism and that has to be resolved, but it's not gonna be resolved uh, in the normal way people think. The way I would say it has to be resolved is that the government has to put forward a mission for the country. Where does this country want to be in 10 to 20 years? And you include all the people in the mission, which has to include the centerpiece of is economic growth. Because one of the reasons that you have ethno-nationalism rising up in various parts of Africa is that certain groups are marginalized. So if there's, if there's a fixed amount of income or product produced in the country, and the ruling group gets more and the other groups get less, then the other groups are gonna fight. If you produce an, an expanding economic output, 
so let's say an expanding economic pie, then everybody is getting an increasing amount of wealth. And there's no wealth produced that's given marginalized to one group versus another. Now, that mission can create the psychology in the country that even though we might not like each other in each one of our ethnic groups, we have a vested self-interest in working together to promote the interest of our nation for our children and our grandchildren to have better lives than we have today. So that does not resolve prejudice and ignorance. Our prejudice comes from ignorance. It doesn't resolve the prejudice and the violent uh, prejudice that exists among various ethnic groups. That may take a while, but you are now creating the conditions for Ethiopians to work together and realize that they will all get a fair return on their involvement in building up their country, not based on their ethnicity. And I have to say, I was very impressed when, the, when Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed launched the Prosperity Party. This was the absolute right thing to do because he established a party that was not ethnic based. I called it a revolutionary necessity at the time. I wrote about it a year or so ago. And he invested a lot of capital and took a lot of chances to do it, but it was the right thing to do. Now we'll see what happens in this election coming up in three months, but that's the right approach. Now, I've not everything everybody does, I agree with, that's fine. But if the key dynamics are right, then the situation can improve. So we have an outside, inside operation to weaken Ethiopia right now. But we also have a problem inside Ethiopia, which has been festering for, since 95, at least 1995, prior longer. And the solution is to unite the Ethiopians. Let us make a single Ethiopian identity stronger than anything else. We're not saying people shouldn't have their cultural rights and their histories. That's good and fine. But the nation state and the Ethiopian identity has to transcend ethnic cultures and ethnicities. And the way to do that is to create a great mission to involve all the people for the benefit of all the people. And that's what I would propose. And, and maybe some people will follow that. What do you mean by uh, regime change? Because we technically just had regime change and we're now in the transition period and we're gonna be facing elections and we have all these challenging things, like you said, you know, the country has been festering um, ethnic issues since 95, everything is boiling. We have other challenges. Um, we'll get to that, including the GERD. Um, basically this transitioning team led by uh, Prime Minister Dr. Abiy Ahmed is being very challenged. And um, what do you mean by that? And um, uh, let's start with that. What do you mean by that? Well, it, I, with my, what's gone on in Ethiopia over the last several years is a legitimate movement inside the country by the people of Ethiopia to change. I uh, can't say that uh, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed went out deliberately and said, we're going to uh, eliminate the power of the TPLF or destroy the TPLF. I don't know that that was his thinking. I think more likely his thinking was, we're going to make the country more open, more democratic, and involve more people, and we're going to eliminate ethnicity-based parties. Now, that did challenge the very rule of the TPLF, because not only did they control Tigray, it was a relatively small population, maybe six, seven million Tigrayan, but they controlled really most of the country, the other nine regions. Therefore, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed's policy or inherently challenged them. Whether that was his intention, I, I can't say, but it doesn't matter because he did the right thing and it challenged their rule and he wants to change the country, which is evident in the prosperity party. That's all being done by Ethiopians for Ethiopians. And that's, I wouldn't have called it regime change. I would have called it a transition, but that's fine. What I'm talking about is that people are using difficult conditions in Ethiopia. Let's say particularly the situation around Tigray and other 
ethnic differences we've had from other leaders such as uh, Jaru and others. And my point is, I would not be surprised that there aren't, there aren't certain NGOs in the West, in Washington, D.C. I don't know for a fact, but I know who they might be, and in Europe, who are going to use this difficult, challenging time to actually remove or build a movement to remove President, uh, Prime Minister Avi Akman and put in another leader who they think, these outside forces, think would be more uh, pliable uh, to their policies. They don't, they would rather have a decentralized ethnic-based country than a homogeneous centralized government represented by one Ethiopian identity. Because if they have a decentralized uh, country where ethnic ethnicity rules and ethno-nationalism rules, then these forces have a very easy time to divide and conquer, to manipulate policy. And that's the primary thing. If you have a, a nationalist leader, and we, I've seen this throughout Africa since the 1960s, and some of the leaders have been not nowhere near as qualified as President, uh, Prime Minister Abiy Ahmed, but they were attacked because they stood up for their country, because they were nationalists. Some of them were killed, some of them were removed from office, some of them were vilified, and I think we're looking at that type of situation where uh, a financial political oligarchy is seeing the opportunity now under this crisis that maybe we can bring in someone who will be more agreeable to the kind of policies we want rather than someone who actually stands up for the nation and the future of Ethiopia and its people. And I'm suggesting that that could be what's uh, occurring right now. Certainly, the, the media coverage uh, against Ethiopia has been uh, faulty. All kinds of crazy things have been said where there's no proof. I mean, I, I'm in, I, get, I get attacked regularly by people in Ethiopia who don't like what I'm saying. But as you can't, this, the, you have to provide a thoughtful understanding of what is going on and if you just simply say we're being there's genocide being committed, I mean, genocide is a very strong term, very strong. I mean, my knowledge of genocide in Africa is I've seen two genocides in the Congo. I saw one in uh, Southwest Africa, but I, I, I genocide means you're intentionally trying to wipe out a people, a culture, and that's a very strong term. And there's no proof, as there was no proof in the charges against Bashir that he was committing genocide in the four. It, ethnic cleansing is a very politically charged term. Do you have the proof for that? And I just looked at some figures and I said, well, they're saying two and a half million children are starving, the 50% of the population. I'm saying, if there's only five to 5.5 million people, can two and a half million be really children? We're not talking about youth, we're talking about adult, uh, pubescent children. That's that's a phenomenal <laughs> number of children to have out of a population. And this, and I began to look at the same thing on these alleged questions of genocide. If there were four and a half million people being starved to death, this would have reached levels of which would be undeniable. That's an enormous amount of people. That's 90% of the great population. So how could that be possible without real strong proof? And when David Beasley went up from the World Food Program, who's a really very dedicated person, he's director of the World Food Program, and he's got a warehouse and he's showing out food to reach people. If there was genocide, Beasley would have seen it. And the, the, once I saw these type of charges being thrown around as, as someone as an old cuss following this African politics and American Western politics for many decades, I said, this is an operation. This is a political operation and we've got to expose it as such. If, you know, for example, you get a picture and it shows a, a, a person on, lying on the ground. And they say, this is an act of genocide by Eritrean or by, by Ethiopian forces to, to wipe out Tigrayans. Well, that's not really evident. I mean, first of all, where was the picture taken? Who, who is this person? 
Was it taken 10 years ago or 10 days ago? Was it taken in Ethiopia? Was it taken in Eritrea? A picture is not evidence. And I smelled a political operation. And from my standpoint, I will throw myself into any fight where I can support the sovereignty of an African nation because they've been under attack uh, since the first slaves were taken out in 1444 on the uh, Lagos. So therefore my, my fight, my mind and my heart goes always to the defense of sovereignty. And I know Ethiopia more than most nations is trying to uplift its people out of poverty by its economic programs. So there was no, there was no it, for me it was an easy decision to make that this country had to be defended against these attacks.